It's February 7th, 2020, and the epidemic is showing no sign of ending, getting better, or anything. <laughs> Which is uh, completely and utterly insane, but that's, that's where we are. And I'm trying to do whatever I can to change that trend. Although, for whatever reason, it seems like Major League Baseball doesn't want to know what's going on. Or they're so into a paradigm that they can't listen to what's going on. You've got the whole Bruce Dark Gratterall thing going on with the Red Sox. As soon as I saw the notification of his involvement in the Mookie Betts trade, I knew that you know, within a minute, I found a couple pictures of him that just showed, you know, Tommy John twist, flat arm syndrome, timing problem. I knew that, I didn't even have to know about his injury problems, although I knew I, I knew he had some level of injury history. He'd already had, remember, the pattern is first it gets the elbow, then it gets the shoulder. Gratterall's already through the elbow part of that and is already showing manifestations of the shoulder part of that pattern. What more do you need to know that Gratterall is just, you know, hopefully he'll be Alex Reyes. Uh, Gratterall is not a starting picture, pitcher. He's a reliever. But for whatever reason, Major League Baseball doesn't seem to be getting that message or doesn't want to hear it. And I think it's more that they don't want to hear it. Part of the problem is driveline and what driveline is saying and how they're spoiling the water. So let me let me give some background on driveline, what I know about driveline. So I've talked about my experience with Tommy Pham. Uh, Tommy Pham approached me in 2010, asked for my help. contacted me again a couple of years later, again asking me for my help. I helped him, you know, he asked for my help, I helped him. We had an agreement that we made, uh, AA Springfield, uh, where I asked him to remember me when he made it to the big leagues because he wasn't making any money. Uh, he didn't live up to that agreement. That's life. As it turns out, a couple of years prior to that, I had actually gotten another email from a guy, a, I, I guess he was a, I guess he had pitched in high school and screwed up his arm and had gone to a little bit of college, uh, and was trying to throw again. Funny last name. Didn't know how to pronounce it. Uh, body, Bodie, something like that. Kyle Bodie Body posted as Kyle B on a couple of the uh, discussion boards that I was on. Uh, let's talk pitching and baseball fever. But seemed like a nice guy, so I engaged with him. He ended up asking me for my help. This is like 2005, 2006. He asked me for my help trying to get healthy because I knew a lot about Dr. Mike Marshall and he was asking me if some of Marshall's ideas could, could be used to get him healthy. This is 2005, 2006. Kyle uh, Bodie asked me if I could use my knowledge of Dr. Marsh Mar Mike Marshall's ideas to help him, Kyle Body, Bodie, to get healthy. And uh, so about 15 years ago, he ends up sending me an email thanking me for the work that I did with him.
So needless to say, <laughs> I was a little surprised when uh, Cal Bodhi turns into my biggest nightmare. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, the word patholog pathological liar pops into uh, mind. I'll just describe him using uh, a phrase that was a favorite of a high school friend of mine, which is lying sack of shit. And I use that phrase because of what he said on Reddit uh, about his experiences with me, which are directly contradicted by that email and some other things. Whatever. The reason I bring that up is that Kyle and the driveline guys over the past 10 or 15 years have very systematically thwarted the efforts of me and the others who are trying to inject some reality into the conversation about pitching mechanics and the reality of the fact that there's no free lunch. If you want to throw harder, that increases the risk. There's very little that you can do to decrease that risk. Basically, throwing harder means more risk. You can't, there's no proven way to condition your way around that. That's just, that's just a fact of life. That's a fact of life in every aspect of life. You know, it's a, it's a simple fact of economics, basically. Uh, and it's kind of strange because I thought Kyle had some background in economics or took some economics classes. But the fact of life, a fact of economics, one of the cardinal rules of economics is that there's no free lunch. You can't get something for nothing. My sense from talking to Kyle and knowing him over 15 years or so is that he's trying with driveline to get something for nothing. And really, Driveline started with Kyle trying to popularize, in some ways, as I did, the ideas of Dr. Mike Marshall. And Kyle really took two ideas from Dr. Mike Marshall. One was Marshall's kind of extreme conditioning ideas. And Kyle took another idea, which in my opinion was Marshall's worst idea, which Marshall called force coupling, which was basically all this glove side stuff, where Marshall's idea was if you're pulling with the glove side, that helps turn the throwing arm side. Kyle has rebranded that into positive disconnection. Uh, it doesn't work for the reason that Marshall thought. It doesn't work for the reason that Kyle says. It works because by driving the front side open, you will tend to cause the pitching arm side to start rotating prematurely while the pitching arm is flat rather than up. Basically, you're, you're teaching pitchers with this positive disconnection stuff, you're teaching pitchers to fly open. By opening the front side early, you're causing the, the front side to open before the pitching arm has time to rotate up. So normally, we don't want to open the front side until the pitching arm has rotated up. We wait for the pitching arm to rotate up, then we open the front side. The problem with positive disconnection is it almost reverses that, where we're going to open the front side, and then we're going to get the arm up. And that's a really, really, okay, it works. Yes, it works. You will throw harder that way, but it also and it, it increases velocity, but as the velocity goes up, so does the risk. The bet that Kyle is making and has made over the past 15 years is that he can take Marshall's extreme conditioning stuff, the weighted balls, the 
brisk weights and all that kind of stuff, the reverse pivots and all that kind of stuff. And he's going to take this extreme conditioning stuff and that's going to compensate for the additional load that's going to happen from throwing from a flat arm position where the arm kind of torques back over as opposed to a vertical arm position where the arm just kind of lays back. I see no evidence that that's working and in my opinion that kind of thinking is what's driving the epidemic. That's why pitchers are throwing harder but it's also why pitchers can't stay healthy. And that's the reality of things uh, but my sense is that Kyle Bodie is essentially the, the Johnny Appleseed of these terrible ideas, especially positive disconnection. He's basically teaching pitchers to fly open, which creates timing problems, which creates what I call flat arm syndrome. Uh, He's done it with the Dodgers. I believe he's done it with the Mariners. He's done it with the Astros. He's done it with the Rays. Uh, and what was interesting was I, be, I believe that he and I were in the Rays at the same time talking. I, I was talking to Matt Arnold 2011, 12, 10, 11, 12, 13. I was definitely with the Rays, talking to the Rays about pro scouting in 2012. I believe that Kyle was there at the same time. Uh, I suspect they ended up going with Kyle. I think the same thing ended up happening happening with the Astros. Uh, but to bring this back to the Bruce Dargraderall issue, I suspect that Kyle won that argument, which is why uh, Heim Bloom, who's now with the Red Sox, he essentially went with Kyle's argument, which is why he believed that Bruce Dargraderall could be rehabilitated and could be turned into a starter, even though I believed that Gratterall, because of the mechanics that I see, because of the Tommy John twist uh, and the flat arm syndrome, I don't see him being anything more than Alex Reyes. Uh, Trevor Rosenthal, you know, another example. Uh, yeah, he throws 100 miles an hour with sync, but... Well, and Jordan Hicks is another example. They, all these guys, you know, they've all got the Tommy John twist where the thumb is the thumb is down here, the arm is flat. The, because the thumb is down at this point, the arm tends to get flat when the shoulders start to rotate, which puts more load on the arm, which causes the arm to torque over backwards. And then you've got a timing problem. Then you get into Tommy John surgery. Uh, Tommy John surgery is a symptom Tommy John surgery fixes a symptom, not a root cause. The root cause is this flat arm syndrome, this timing problem. And eventually the same thing that gets first gets the elbow will ultimately get the shoulder because you're not addressing the root cause, you're just addressing the symptom. Tommy John surgery just addresses the symptom. You know, generally it gets the elbow, then it gets the shoulder. Sometimes it can get the elbow, then it can get the elbow again. That's kind of... Shelby Miller is in that kind of thing. It's hard to predict. It really doesn't matter whether it gets the elbow than the elbow or the elbow than the shoulder. Uh, Glass now's Tyler Glass now with the Rays looks like uh, he had a flexor tendon problem in 2019. He's having a wrist problem that I suspect is probably related to. He had an, a flexor tendon problem is really an elbow problem where the elbow starts to loosen up and transfers some of the load from uh, the UCL, which runs right here, into the flexor tendon, which kind of runs in the same path. Uh, that can overload. The flexor tendon can also overload the nerves that are running in the wrist. Same basic thing. I think uh, Glass now will be lucky to make it through the 2020 season. Raise fans, you know, cross your fingers. Uh, hold your breath. But all this stuff is going on. Nothing is changing. Nothing is getting fixed. And I'm getting sick of it. And I'm here because I want to address it. And I want to solve it. Judging timing. One of the reasons I'm doing this video is because people during the off season were talking about judging timing and they were talking about it badly. And some of that is because I'm not talking about it completely 
clearly, and some of that is because I'm keeping things proprietary, I obviously have a huge advantage in terms of determining whether pitchers are going to break or not, and that comes down to my ability to judge timing. But I'm here to open the kimono to a degree and to give a sense of, at a minimum, what I do not do in terms of judging time. Because I've had, a, yeah, I've had a number of studies over the past couple of years where people say they've replicated my methods, you know, for Tommy John twist, especially your timing, and they're not finding anything. But every time I read those studies, I find problems in those studies, generally because they are using stride foot contact as a milestone. Let me say it here. Let me say it now. Let me say it completely clearly. I do not use stride foot contact as a milestone because stride foot contact is an unreliable milestone. There are so many different ways for pitchers to make contact with the ground and there are so many ways for pitchers to make stride foot contact and to define stride foot contact that it's a useless measure. It's too variable to be useful. Stride foot contact is not something I pay attention to. And I've made that clear really starting about 10 years ago and especially in the past five or more years ago in conversations with Matt Blake when he was with the Cleveland Indians. Uh, I think he's with the Yankees now. I don't pay attention to pitchers' feet. When I'm tweeting out pictures, I will pay attention to pitch. I will talk about pitchers' feet, but that's only at the grossest level because I'm trying to make a point. But when I'm analyzing pitchers and when I'm analyzing the pitcher, the timing of pitchers to do an analysis of pitchers, I do not look at pitchers' feet. I don't look at stride foot contact. For a while, I looked at foot plant. But, and I defined foot plant as the moment when the foot plant, when the, when the front foot, the stride foot is planted in the ground, firm. That, that was a pretty good metric for a while. And up until 10 or so years ago was a pretty good metric. It's not a good metric anymore. Stride foot contact is no good. Foot plant is no good. Not anymore. Because of all the positive disconnection stuff, all the glovey stuff, it's leading to external torso rotation where the shoulders are rotating before the feet are planted. When I'm judging timing in baseball pitchers, I ignore the feet. I don't even care about the feet. I don't even videotape the feet. All I care, all I watch is the upper body. Because what the feet are doing is irrelevant. Because what pitching coaches are teaching, largely because of what the driveline guys are teaching, especially with the, the positive disconnection stuff, with the glove side stuff, some because of the scap stuff with the bilateral Nyman scap loading stuff, but it's more because of the it's more because of the positive disconnection glove side stuff that has so screwed up pitchers timing and made pitchers shoulders so early that what their feet are doing in the case of high level throwers at a minimum and high level throwers are the ones who are going to get hurt you know Lots of problems at lower level throwers, but they're not, they're not throwing hard enough to get hurt. But if you're talking about pitchers who are throwing hard enough to hurt themselves, generally what their feet are doing is completely irrelevant. What matters is what their upper body is doing in terms of their timing. What matters is what their shoulders are doing. Don't worry about their feet. Stop worrying about their feet. Stop analyzing things on the basis of their feet. I don't watch pitchers' feet anymore. I use it for illustrative purposes because it kind of sort of works, and it, especially when you're dealing with older classic guys, Nolan Ryan, Bob Gibson, Tom Seaver, 
uh, still works for Verlander, uh, works for, works for uh, Bumgarner, you know, a few of the older school guys, what the feet are doing still works, but for all the new school guys, Jordan Hicks, <laughs> none of the hard, you know, Alex Reyes, nope, Jordan Hicks, nope, uh, Gratterall, nope, none of the hard throwers, Strasburg, nope. Uh, I learned a lot from learning to, I learned a lot about Strasburg and became a much bad, better analyzer of Strasburg by learning to ignore Strasburg's feet. What his feet are doing is irrelevant. It, it used to be relevant, but it's less and less relevant. Why? Because of all the glove side stuff, because everybody's flying open now. Everybody's teaching this, you know, kind of rip the glove, pull the glove, fly open with the glove side. That's all causing problems on the backside, uh, and it's made what the feet are doing almost completely irrelevant in terms of pitchers who are throwing hard enough to hurt themselves. Uh. So let's talk about acceleration and a paper that I wrote 10 years ago or so, may have been 15 years ago, called A Revised Baseball Pitching Cycle, which I now need to re-revise because of all the driveline positive disconnection glove side stuff, because now my revised baseball pitching cycle is out of date because of all the glove side stuff has made it all, that was all based on foot plant and it's all completely out of date because again, stride foot contact, foot plant, it's all irrelevant because upper bodies, glove sides are so terrible because the vast majority of pitchers are flying open. Another bugaboo that I have is the word and the phase acceleration. And this is a bugaboo that I had 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and it's still a problem and one of the things that prompted me and that brought up the concept, that, that brought up the problem, that kind of brought driveline back into this is the driveline is Driveline is parroting the conventional wisdom about the pitching sequence. When I, when I analyzed and came to understand the baseball pitching sequence, I realized just how flawed that was. Now, maybe it worked for convenience and, and illustrative purposes, but from analytical and teaching and injury prevention purposes, the existing baseball pitching cycle with early cocking, late cocking, acceleration, deceleration, it doesn't work. It has no purpose, it has no value in terms of injury prediction or prevention, which is why the state of the art hasn't advanced in terms of injury prediction or prevention. And that's why my why my work is so advanced in terms of injury prediction and prevention is because I've, I've completely abandoned the conventional state-of-the-art baseball pitching cycle. Uh, you know, Driveline recently tweeted, you know, kind of the conventional wisdom, a recent version of that. There's, there's no difference between that and the versions that were popular 15 or 20 years ago, just the resolutions are higher and the graphics are a little bit better. But there's, there's no more truth to those diagrams than there was 15 or 20 years ago. And I saw that within a six months or a year of really starting to understand this stuff. It's, you can't, you can't understand and fix a problem if you don't analyze it correctly. And the existing baseball pitching cycle does not analyze the problem, does not break down the problem, does not milestone the problem correctly. And a lot of it comes down to the definition of acceleration. And I, I, made, I made a mistake myself in terms of my revised baseball pitching cycle. Uh, I... I made the mistake of basing that on stride foot contact. That was a reasonable mistake at the time because that was 10 years ago or so and stride foot contact was still a pretty good 
milestone, but in the in the intervening ten years, it's 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 not a good milestone anymore. So what I need to do is put together a revised revised baseball pitching cycle, and I'm in the process of doing that. And what I would do, what I am going to do in that revised revised baseball pitching cycle, is completely ignore the feet. All that matters is what the arm is doing. And acceleration is the key concept in terms of understanding injury risk and prevention. Because acceleration equals load, and load equals injury risk. So the simplest thing to understand is that, all right, so I'm a pitcher, you're the center field camera. My glove side is, is here. This is my pitching arm side. So all we're going to worry about is my pitching arm side. And really, we don't have to worry about the ball here. We're just going to worry about my pitching arm side elbow, which is just below the level of my shoulders. The olecranon right here, which for some reason in my case is really red, but hopefully you should be able to see it, just below the level of my shoulders. The thing to understand is that as soon as my olecranon, as soon as the point of my elbow starts coming around, starts moving, that's acceleration right there. That's when we need to start keeping track of acceleration. The, the problem with the conventional wisdom of the baseball pitching cycle is it doesn't start paying attention to the olecranon until it's way over here. It doesn't define acceleration until about 90 degrees later. It's missing 90 degrees of rotation and 90 degrees of acceleration, which is why the conventional wisdom about the baseball pitching cycle is missing all this stuff in terms of injuries. As soon as the olecranon, as soon as the, the elbow starts to turn, that puts the arm under load. And as it, as it turns and as it starts to move faster, that's acceleration. As the, the speed of that turning increases, that's acceleration. As that increases, we get more and more external rotation. As the acceleration increases, we get more and more external rotation as the arm lays back. I start out at this 90 degree angle. As that, ex as that acceleration starts, my, my forearm starts to lay back into this kind of back position and I can't lay it back as much as it normally would. It'll go back to here or so. But just, you know, just ignore, just ignore my, my forearm. Just think about, you know, I've got this kind of T position here. Ignore my forearms. I've got my glove side arm here. I've got my pitching arm here, just my upper arms. And throwing is just a process of just kind of turning this T with my hips. As I step and throw, I'm turning this T, and I turn this T, you know, roughly 180 degrees or so. The act of throwing, I, I close it a little bit, and then I turn it 180 degrees. Forget what my forearms are doing. Just pay attention to this T right here, which is, you know, basically my spine, my upper arms, out to my elbows. That's, that's kind of the key motor of this. You know, I've got the scaps in here, there's some mobility in terms of here, but that's more like the suspension. The engine is gonna be the serape muscles that run from hip to shoulder, hip to shoulder. So throwing is just a matter of accelerating my upper arm around towards the target. But acceleration is just whatever my, you know, and I'm just, let's ignore what the glove side is doing. Acceleration is whatever my glove side, is, or whatever my upper arm pitching side is doing. A little bit of scap load, that's still, that's still, that's negative acceleration. Negative acceleration, positive acceleration. But the reason why the state of the art is missing this stuff on injuries is that they're missing this 90 
to 100 degrees of motion of acceleration. They're not defining acceleration until way over here, and they're only defining acceleration as being what the forearm does. Well, what the forearm does is a result of what the upper arm does. This is just a whip. This is more, this is much close, what the upper arm is doing is much closer to what the engine is. So basically the, the throwing cycle in slow motion is this. My shoulders, my hips pull my shoulders around, which causes my shoulders to turn, which causes my upper arm to turn, which causes my elbow to turn. As soon as my elbow starts to turn and come around, that's acceleration. That's load. My pitching arm is under load. If you watch this in slow motion, and I've got a picture of, I've got a clip of Justin Verlander that shows exactly this. You can see, as his shoulders start to turn, his arm will lay back into external rotation, then it will kind of fly out, and then he gets into the release point and then decelerates. But nothing really interesting is happening here. What's really interesting, all the interesting stuff, all the real load is happening during this point when the arm is accelerating and the arm is externally rotating. This is these 90 degrees right here from the start of rotation into, ex into the peak external rotation. This is the stuff that matters. These 90 degrees are what matters and the conventional pitching cycle basically ignores them. This gets written off as being early cocking and late cocking and they don't think this is acceleration. They, don't, they call this acceleration when really this is acceleration here. Acceleration is going on here. Acceleration is what causes early cocking and late cocking and acceleration is what causes pitching injuries and it's what causes pitchers to get hurt. And it's so important that you get that right. Finally, in terms of technology, I use video primarily. As you can see, as, as you can see in this clip of uh, Justin Verlander, I'm using uh, a Panasonic GH5. I can run that up to 240 frames a second at full HD. And with a little bit of creativity and wiliness, I can get the angles that I need to judge exactly what's going on. Uh, I know people, the stadiums with teams who can get me the right angles that I need. Uh, the folks at Modus were nice enough to send me a sensor. I've played with that over the years. Uh, I've not been convinced of the reliability of the Modus sensor. I need to update the firmware, do another set of tests of that, but I was not impressed with the reliability because I got, my, my background is software testing. I've tested some of the biggest data warehouses in the world. I know testing. I was not able to get reliable results out of my Modus sleeve. Uh, I'm a little concerned that Modus seems to have gotten away from the direct measurement of metrics and is more about kind of workload management, which suggests, suggests to me that that they have seen the same thing and that they're not completely convinced, or it's possible that they're not convinced that their metrics are consistent from pitch to pitch, which may be why they're moving toward, more towards workload management. Uh, I need to do another set of tests. That was about a year ago, uh, but you know, right now I find that video cameras 
uh, even just my iPhone, I've got an iPhone SE, which is which will do 120 frames a second, 240. Uh, that's plenty good in terms of judging timing. You know, I prefer certain angles, getting multiple angles. If you can get in front or behind, that works best. The nice thing is you don't have to get a GH5 anymore. An iPhone is good enough. I think the Samsungs are good enough. That's, that's the real breakthrough is how cheap the good technology is. The only reason I have a GH5 is that I can get a really good zoom lens and I can get really good video of any picture I want from anywhere in the stadium. That's the only reason I have a fancy camera uh, is because of the zoom lenses. For an ordinary person who's just filming, even, even a coach who has access to any player, you know, who can just walk up to a player, you don't need the fancy stuff. Uh, like I said, I'm going to test the Moda stuff. I was not convinced of the reliability of it. Uh, I'm not convinced that the spin rate stuff, the Rapsodo stuff is necessary. I've got a good enough eye and ear that I can tell you know, what a good breaking ball is. Uh, I, I still have a good enough eye that I can see it out of the hand. I, I'll know out of the hand whether a curveball is going to bite or not. Uh, don't kill yourself if you can't afford the technology. You know, it, you, you can get a lot out of an iPhone. You can, you can do a lot with an iPhone uh, and you can accomplish a lot with an iPhone just learning to go through the video, kind of slide back and forth. Uh, what I'm focusing on is producing a lot of flipbooks and a lot of other video resources that show what Verlander does, what Aroldis Chapman does, what uh, Mariano Rivera, Rivera do, so that people understand what the best pictures, what the best pitchers do, actually what they look like in slow motion, so that people can compare their pitchers to the greatest pitchers in the world.